honor and privilege to be here today to speak to you about business news, which for most people is very, very boring and dry. So when you say business news, you know, even, even myself, I think, how exciting could that be? So I want to give you an overview of what this is, you know, defining it, and um, really zeroing in and focusing in on content and revenue, the, the relationship between content and revenue. And what I'd like to do is make this more of a conversation uh, amongst ourselves uh, instead of a lecture. So I want to spend a good deal of time answering a, a lot of your questions. So I, I would ask each and every one of you to start thinking about any questions you have. Um, because I, I don't think um, having me stand here and lecture to you will be uh, nearly as valuable um, as it would be, um, you know, instead of, uh, instead of or it would be much more valuable to have a conversation um, about this. So I've put together um, a small presentation to take us through uh, defining um, business news and then the relationship between content and revenue. Now let me just say something about content and revenue. Uh, a lot of people in our business believe it's just about revenue. And I believe it's, you have to have content before you can have revenue. Now, I'm a little biased because I come from the content side of the business. I come from the content creation side of the business. I don't come from the revenue side of the business. And I would argue that it's more difficult for people from the revenue side to understand content and easier for content people to understand revenue. So I'd like to just take you through this and I'm going to try to figure out how to operate this thing. Okay, so what is business news? Um, it's markets, companies, currencies, commodities, investors, business leaders, politics, and current affairs. It's news events and market reaction. This is very important, and I'm going to show you what this is. And it's data, company and government data. The first point we'll, we'll look at in, in, in greater depth in the next uh, couple of slides. But when I want to talk a little bit about news event market reaction. Does anybody out there, do you, do you have any ideas what this is? I'd like to just hear from somebody at the beginning and just kind of try to understand your ideas. Is there anybody out there that understands news event and then market reaction? A anybody can stand up, uh, raise your hand. What is it? If you understand it, tell me what it is. Uh, you would like to understand what is the event and then the news that comes, I mean, like news event and... Uh... Yeah, so, so give me an example of a news event and then what, what do I mean by market reaction? Okay, uh, let it be that uh, the CEO of Uber has been uh, dismissed. He resigned under the request of the investors, right? Just recent news on uh, yep, yep. yes. So uh, and the market reaction is that the Uber uh, share prices go went up. Is that what you mean? Or, That's I what mean, I mean. It could, okay. it could go when, uh, down. Or and the sure. thing is that and the thing is that uh, the um, like if we talk about communication and business, uh, the news can uh, open. I mean, like can heavily influence your. Um, a st a sustainability on the market, like for example, British Petroleum when they had this uh, uh, leakage uh, in uh, uh, Mexican Gulf, and they uh, didn't answer in like 20 minutes in the era of Twitter, and uh, when they answered, they said like I'm I'm on a vacation and I'm a human and I have time. I mean, I have a right for my vacation. That was absolutely the wrong thing. I don't know. They lost like 20, 30 percent of their share price. So it was just like uh, the consequence and the 
mind-related thing, right? Is that yeah, that, that's want? right. That's right. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make sure. What, what I'll do throughout this um, this talk is to stop and and make sure that everybody um, fully understands uh, what, what I'm saying because business news can be uh, quite complicated, and I really want to uh, simplify it. I'll give you another example. Yesterday, the big story was um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the um, had been the third in command in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, is now uh, the heir to the throne. That was announced yesterday, which moved the oil markets. Uh, so that was a big deal. So, so in terms of, you know, at Bloomberg, we have to get it right uh, because there is, um, there, there's, such, uh, there's such pressure on market reaction. Uh, if, if our, you know, our news is really, really important because it moves the markets um, up or down. Uh, data, the f finally on data, when we talk about company and government data, okay, company data, it, you know, each quarter, four quarters in the year, companies report their earnings. It could be Nike, it could be GE, Procter & Gamble, they report their earnings. If the earnings are, are less than estimated, the stock goes down. Better than estimated, the stock goes up. Government data, we're all about government data. We get jobs reports, we get interest rates uh, reports. When uh, the Federal Reserve announces the interest rates, whether it's um, increase or decrease, the markets react. And, and a lot of what we do in business news uh, is around government data. So these are the, the headlines, the basic headlines of the stuff that we talk about. Most of my career, I was talking about front lines and deadlines, uh, the latest conflict in Kashmir, um, a fire in London, um, the arrest of a professional athlete. Um, I was a police reporter. I was an investigative reporter. I was covering aviation. And then I joined Bloomberg. We don't cover any of that really. We, don't fo we, we, we touch on it, but we don't put a lot of resources into uh, things like police investigations, into fires, into crime, into armed conflict. We put a lot of resources into breaking news about guys like Zuckerberg, Gates, Buffett, Jamie Dimon, Jack Ma. These are the kinds of headlines. Of course, we get into politics. Former President Lula on trial, that's a story for us because it could affect the market. And, and of course, politics is very interesting, okay? So this is, this is kind of the kind of stuff we cover. Um, we're very interested in, in the uh, one belt, one road, uh, the, the Chinese government's policy and how it affects Kazakhstan. Um, and that's a beautiful shot of, of Astana that I did uh, 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 for, for this class. So one belt, one road, economy. The IPO of Facebook, the initial public offering on that given day, there was a lot of fanfare. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg was there, and you know, um, Sheryl Sandberg you see, you see the head of the NASDAQ. And so it's moments like these that we, we thrive on. We, we, we build these moments up because that's what our viewers demand, and we have to make we have to make the content interesting in order to look at revenue opportunities. Alibaba, what a story, right? Uh, with Jack Ma on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. One of the biggest IPOs of the last decade. Um, so back to what is business news? Well, it's, it's headlines and moments. And, and that could be argued for a lot of news is headlines and moments, but this is really um, dependent on big, big headlines. And we'll talk about this later, but, but really getting into the people who run these companies, the people who are behind these IPOs or these successful or unsuccessful companies, really telling those stories. This is where business news gets a little bit, I would say, boring. Do you, does anybody agree that business news is boring? 
Everybody says yes, right? It's boring, right? Um, let me get through this and then tell you why it doesn't have to be boring. So you have the equity markets, and it's really important if you work at you know, Bloomberg, the Financial Times, CNBC, really any news organization, you, you really do have to get to understand the markets. And for the first 16 years of my career, I really had no idea about any of this stuff until I joined Bloomberg. You have to know this if you're going to work at Bloomberg. Like We're surrounded by it all day long. So the markets, equity markets, New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, Shanghai Stock Exchange. These are, these are the stock markets. These are, you know, if, does anybody own stock in Boeing here? Or, I don't know, Nike? Anybody own stock in anything? Sue, I know you own a lot of stock. <laughs> So these, these are the stock markets. This is what a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people, it could be like myself or you know, anybody in this room, you, you have a, a stock account and you invest in certain public companies. Come out of these markets. Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CME, the New York Mercantile Exchange, NYMEX, um, you know, CME Group. These are, these are metals, you know, gold, silver, coffee, um, and then there's the currency markets. And, and I, I care about currency because I have most of my life in the United States, and I, I need, you know, I have dollars, but I earn in British pounds. So in the post-Brexit era, the British pound, you know, compared to the U.S. dollar is worth much less. It's off about 25%. It's one of the worst performing currencies in the world. So if, you know, for example, you're earning Kazakhstani tangy here and you have to go, I don't know, maybe you're moving to the UK or you're moving to the US, your money is in, you know, in local currency, you have to figure out how much it's going to be worth in the United States or in Japan with the yen. So this, for me, is, is very, very important. Now, I don't have a lot of money by any stretch but I have, a, I have more than I did 20 years ago. And when you have a little bit of money, you're worried about things like this. You're worried about uh, currency markets and equity markets. I think if you're a trader, you're looking at commodities or if you, if you have money in gold or silver or, I don't know, in a, in a coffee cooperative in East Africa, you might be worried about coffee prices. Or if you own shares of Starbucks, you'd be worried about coffee prices, okay? Companies, now these, these are companies, and this is basic stuff, and we'll, we'll get into a, a, a broader conversation here, but I wanna, I wanna give you the basics. These are companies from the Dow 30. Y'all know what the Dow 30 is? Everybody? Okay. It's the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the 30 blue chip, blue, blue chip companies. Um, in the world, Boeing, General Electric, Alibaba, Apple, Coca-Cola, Nike, Procter & Gamble, and Facebook among, among the companies. So when you see the Dow Jones Industrial Average, it's the average share price of these companies. And so, you know, like today, I'm just, you know, I have the, our, the Bloomberg terminal on my phone here, and, you know, Boeing today, you know, beat Airbus in orders for the first time since 2012 at one of the air shows. I don't know if it's in Farnborough or in, in Paris. And so their stock is going to go up as a result of that. Now, if it had it been the other way around, Boeing stock would have went down. So now that Boeing has beaten them for the first time since 2012, Boeing will go up, Airbus will go down. Back to currencies. So we, like, like I said, when we work in business news, we just, this is our language. This is what we, this is what the language we speak, where if you work in, in, in general news or international news, you're, you're across the, the politics 
or the, you know, the political situation in the, the Middle East. You know, we, I mean, back in when I was a, a reporter for Al Jazeera, I was very focused on uh, the Middle East uh, conflict and all of the players, uh, which is, is very, very complicated. Or if you were a political reporter in Washington, you, you're across all of the different, you know, Commerce Department, State Department, White House, uh, Federal Reserve. It's, a, it's just a, a whole different beat. But this is really our language in currency. So the main currency, the USD, the British pound, Hong Kong dollar, Japanese yen, euro, uh, Chinese won, Remnabai, and uh, I added the, the Kazakhstani tangi for you there. But it's, it's all part of the language that, that we speak. And it's so important that when, when we, we see this, that we understand this. And this is where, like for me, news is, is a little complicated. I mean, this, this business news has forced me to, to really try to, you know, exercise another muscle in my, in my brain that I, did, I didn't know I had. I mean, I, I think more about, about news and, and how it affects the world being in, in, in the, the universe of, of business news because it affects so many people and there's so many lines into and, and out of the, the kind of stuff that, that, we, uh, that we cover. Any questions uh, as we, we get to this point about what we've talked about? Come on. Are you excited about business news? Do you want to be business news journalists? <laughs> or is it too dry? Yeah? No? Okay. All right, so currencies. I care about currencies. You, you probably won't care about currencies until, until you have to. <laughs> it's not a problem until it's a problem. And so in the last five or six years, I've earned uh, in Hong Kong dollars, Mexican pesos, and now in um, British pounds. So I'm always looking at the currency markets. We've, we've touched on this, but it is, it is important to understand. And, and, you know, a lot of what we're looking at, I had no idea before I joined uh, Bloomberg. Commodities, energy. You must be looking at the oil markets. Is, are you, is everybody in here paying attention to oil? Yes, because this is, this is an oil-producing country. This is, this is basically the economy of of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, well, Qatar is natural gas mainly, but they have oil, United States, Mexico, Venezuela, Russia. I mean, in many ways, and, and, and you can argue against this, but I think, you know, the energy markets is what makes the world go around. Um, just what, five years ago, uh, crude oil was at $110 a barrel. And now it's around 50, is it 47 today? So you can imagine, I mean, countries, their budgets are set or have been set on north of $100 a barrel and now they're getting $50 a barrel. So I'm always very interested in, in, in the crude oil markets, like West Texas Intermediate. Have you heard of that? Anybody? WTI? Brent Oil? Okay, so I'm always looking at Brent and WTI, mainly because not not so much because my everyday job requires it, but I'm I'm curious about this because it's my my newfound sort of the stuff that I've learned since I I joined Bloomberg five and a half years ago. Uh, precious metals, uh, gold, silver, silver copper, copper, uh, platinum, and agriculture, which we've we've touched on. All right, this is uh, this is the big question: how how do we make this is a lot of data that, that I've just thrown at you. I'd love some ideas from, from all of you about how do we make this stuff interesting. We know, we know people are going to care. People are going to care because it affects their bottom line. It affects their stock account if they have a stock account. It could affect their currencies such as the situation that I'm in. It could affect 
uh, a lot of things, their own budgets. But we still have to make it interesting because from my perspective, nobody really worries about money until they have to. I mean, think about it. Money, if you're a regular person, it's a number on a screen. And if you don't have to worry about it and you, you live within your means, okay, well, that's, that's stuff on, you know, whatever, CNBC or Bloomberg or Fox Business or in the Financial Times is, it's just a bunch of data, right? So what do you think? What, what, I mean, I would like to hear from, from, from somebody here. What, what do you, how, do we, how do we make this interesting? You tell me about how we can get all this data and make people care. Like the how, like the changes in like currencies, how they affect some like events, like decisions made by governments, something like that. Maybe like the outcomes of. Yeah, I mean that that's a good. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good point. You you have to, you know, you have to put a face to the data. Okay, you have to, you know, you have to kind of, right here. Yeah. It's real. It, at the end of the day, business news isn't that much different than general news or. I mean, entertainment news, right? It's, it's about people, uh, real stories about real, real people. So, um, you know, there's a lot of data, and then who does it affect? There's a jobs report out from, from the U.S. Who does it affect? The, the oil markets are up or down, and, you know, who does it affect? Okay, so you have to put a face to the data, and, and you, have to, you have to tell these stories around people. And I, I would argue that in traditional business news, the way we look at it today, we have trouble doing that on a daily basis because it's really, really difficult to, you know, in terms of news gathering and the investment in news gathering and going out there to, to find people who are affected every day. A lot of business news is just people talking, right, which is, which is a little bit boring. Okay, that's what makes it boring. So, so, so finding people that are affected, real people that we could all relate to is, is difficult and um, we, we, we struggle with that, with that part of the equation. Uh, cause and effect. Market goes up, market goes down, who's affected? Kind of the same thing, right? Um, but we definitely have to put a face, a face to the data. Um, what we do particularly well in business news and really, really well at Bloomberg, we break news. We break stories. Like we're, I always say, always be first, but first be right, okay? If, if you're first and you're wrong, it's a, it's a huge problem. So always be first, but first be right. And, and so a lot of what, what we do really, really well and what our viewers and our users and our clients, our customers, what they expect is that we're going to have the story before anybody else. We're going to have the story on MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, yesterday in Saudi Arabia, before anybody else. I want to take you just to a quick experience I had while writing for Bloomberg News uh, when I was in uh, neighboring Mongolia. And it, it does kind of touch on this always be first, but first be right. And it was a breaking story, and it was very, very sensitive. Is anybody familiar with the Oyu Tolgoy copper mine in the South Gobi Desert? Show of hands. Anybody? Never heard of it? So when it's in operation in the next, well, I don't know, three or four years, it'll be the fourth largest copper mine in the world, and will make up 30 to 35 percent of the Mongolian economy something I think you might want to check out. It's a pretty big operation. Um, when I was living there from 2012 to 2014, the um, government of Mongolia and Rio Tinto, the company that was, um, that is um, developing the mine, uh, you know, a very well-known uh, mining company that probably has operations here, 
they were, there was a conflict between the government and, um, and Rio Tinto. And, you know, I was, you know, an executive producer. I'm always a reporter. Now I do a lot of reporting off the record. <laughs> I don't do uh, reporting for, for publication anymore, unless there's really a massive story. <laughs> You know, somebody from, from Rio Tinto um, approached me in a cafe and said, you know, the, the OU Tolgoy mine is going to shut down. They're going to halt production at the mine. And I thought, wow, that's, that's, that's a tip. Because the, the whole, a big part of the Mongolian economy depends on the mine, operations at the mine. There are a lot of foreign workers there. There's... I mean, it's a big part of the economy. And so I thought, wow, that's, that's like really, really interesting. So I wrote it down and I said, to, I said to the source at this point, I said, so like, what's your name? He said, well, I, I don't want to give you my name. I said, okay, so it's just this guy who says he is an employee at the Rio Tinto, the Oyotolgoy mine. Okay, well, I, I called an editor, like a, you know, somebody in, I think, Beijing, and I said, look, this is what I have, and he said, look, you need a lot more. You've, you've got one, basically you have one source on the story. That's not really a source because you don't even know his name. So I went back to the source, and I said, I, I asked the question a different way. I said, do you have a business card? And he gave me his business card. So what did that give me? His name. <laughs> so the, the editor wanted the business card. So we, we reporters can be, you know, creative at times. So I, I just, I asked the question. He said, yeah, sure, here's my business card. Had his name. I took a picture of that. I sent it to the editor. So we still had one source on the story, but it was a big story. And everybody was, at Bloomberg News, was very excited about this. So it went, you know, I said, look, this is what I have. This is what they're telling me. It went from the editor in Beijing to like a team of editors in Singapore. I think somebody, in, I was watching the email chain as people were looking at the story and approving it. And it went to Sydney, then it went to London, and finally to New York. And somebody, an editor, called Rio Tinto and said, you know, do you have a comment on this? And they said, no comment. And they said, if we report the story, will you will you demand a retraction? And they said no. Which meant what? It meant it was true. If you, if you, if you uh, publish the story, we will not, you know, we will not demand a retraction from Rio Tinto. The reason I tell you this story is that there's, there's, there's a couple of things here. What we put out in business news, what we publish, what we report, is so, so important because it can, of course, affect a company's stock. And of course, if, if we're wrong, it affects our credibility. And, and we, if we, without our credibility, we, we have nothing. So it went through this chain of editors all the way through to London and New York, and we finally reported the story. Uh, sourced, you know, according to two people familiar with the project. Um, and once we put the story out, the stock of Rio Tinto's subsidiary, which is called Turquoise Hill, is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, the TSX. Once we published this story, the stock started to plummet, like freefall plummet. And then Reuters put out a story, our, one of our main competitors, Reuters put out a story kind of like a softer story from Rio Tinto's PR. Um, and then it was just back and forth. Bloomberg story, Reuters story. Anyway, they, they had to stop trading on uh, Turquoise Hill stock. The, the Toronto Stock Exchange had to halt trading because it was losing value so fast. So now if we were wrong about this story, it's a big problem for us because we've just almost put a company out of business. Um, and that hurts our credibility and cuts at the core of our business with our customers and our, our viewers and, and uh, the users of our data. So it's really, really critical what, what we put out there. Um, and, and I think, I mean, I don't, previous to, to my experience in business news, I had never done a story 
that uh, affected the, the, the share price of a company like that. It was, I, I almost felt, felt bad. I was like, wow, broke a story in <laughs> of the poor people over there. Uh, so uh, that, that's just one experience that, that I've had in, in, um, in, in business news. Are there any questions at this point? Because I think that, that, ex that, that example right there um, is quite interesting, especially if you're going into business news and you're looking to, to break stories and, and, and make headlines. Anything? I know you have a question in the front row. Anything? No. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like, um, could be like the question of uh, whether like publish or not publish something like, for example, like the example you've given about Mongolia, like for example, uh, uh, could be a question of publishing an article that could affect like stock market, be considered as like a part of like journalist ethics or something like that. Uh, is it like the, I don't know, like, can journalist ethic, um, like, has its own, like, opinion of you on it? Like, so, it so, yeah, I mean, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, so you, you mean getting the guy's card when you didn't want to give yeah, me his maybe, name? Yeah, maybe, like, okay. because, like, it affects a lot of people. It's a very, very good question. And, you know, we, he, he asked that his name not be used. And we, we agreed to that. His name was not used. Like, it, it was never published. The public didn't know that a, an employee had given me this information. What we needed to, put the, to, to report the story, however, is we needed to know that the source was real, that it was really an employee giving us this information. So we do, as, as journalists, we struggle with these kinds of ethical questions of where, where are we you know, um, crossing the line or where are we getting, when are we getting too close to the, the ethical line. So this is certainly um, was a, a, an example, a situation where we got very, very close to uh, the, the, the standards and practices, the ethics of, um, of getting a story out. But, I, but, but my, our position was always that we did right by the source. The source just didn't want their name out. And we really had to confirm that it was, it was a, a company insider because we weren't gonna put this story out if it had been somebody who had you know, heard a rumor um, in another cafe. Maybe, you know, maybe the person went to you know, two cafes before he came to the cafe I was in and really wasn't a, a primary source. Um, now, just let me, on that, on that point, do you know the difference between primary sources and secondary sources? Um, not sure. Primary source is somebody who, like, really knows. Yeah. That's like the, you know, um, you know the, the general in the military, the police chief, the, the fire chief, they, they know for sure. Secondary is somebody in the organization who kind of knows what's going on. They, they're in the know, but they're not primary. That's when you need a second and a third, sometimes a fourth source, okay? So this was a, this was a secondary source, so we had to be very careful and we had to make sure that um, this individual, you know, was, was credible. Okay, maybe like the next question, maybe like um, for you, like for the company, like what's the first, like is the truth like before like, um, before the possible consequences of publishing, for, if take an example, like maybe like there's some monopolies, like oil monopolies in some like small country or like, some other kind of monopolies, and for example, you release an article and you fully uh, understand that it could, um, that it could affect like the, maybe like the economy of a whole country or like the uh, financial situation inside this company, like possible like maybe like uh, firings in this company, for example. So in this case, is truth uh, before like the, I don't know, like before some maybe um, like the possibilities of causing like the bad effect on like economies or like whole like, uh, big groups of people that work in these businesses. Well, sure, I mean, I think if you, if you believe in journalism, truth is, you know, truth always prevails. That's what we're, we as journalists are, are seeking. And put yourself in, 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 in the shoes of an investor who is, you know, investing in this, this company, Rio Tinto, or in Turquoise Hill, the subsidiary of Rio Tinto. They're an investor, so they, 
you would think they have a right to know because they, they own a, a small piece of the company. So certainly, um, you know, sometimes, look, you know, sometimes the news is good. Sometimes, you know, we, we go into a country and it's great and everybody's happy. And sometimes the news isn't so good. We still have a, an obligation to report it. Otherwise, if we only report the good news, it's called propaganda, right? Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, well, mentioning the, in, the audience um, and acting in the interest of an audience. So um, in generic news, that would be um, public. So you act as a journalist in the public interest. And that's what keeps you motivated when you go into that, you know, gray areas of getting information and making it public. But when it comes to business news, so who do you think the first of? I mean, who in whose interest do you act? Is that the investors? Well, sure. I mean, look, it's it, it's still the public interest, um, and and we, you know, it's it, we're looking for, for for the true story in whether it's a company or a country. I mean, that that is our that is our duty um, to find this out. So certainly, it's still in the public interest. Um, if it's if it's a public company, now there are private companies out there where we really can't. You know, it's a private company. We don't we don't have that information. But certainly, if 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 you all are my audience and you're investors in General Electric or you're an investor in a in a in an oil field in you know uh, Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan, you know you you have a right to know. And so we're always thinking as journalists, we're always thinking about doing right by the process, if you will. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it, but we want to do right by the source, okay? Like in, in this example with the, the copper mine in Mongolia, we did right by the source. We were, we were very honest. We said we won't publish your name, but we need to know that you, you're credible. Um, and then, you know, look, let's be real. Some people in, in Mongolia were not that happy with us. But, you know, journalists aren't out there to make people happy. We're out there to, you know, report the truth and, you know, do it ethically and within standards and practices. And so, um, yeah, it's, to answer your question directly, we're, we're, it's all in the public's interest. And it, just as long as we're, we're ethical in the way we get our information... And I think it's fair. How viable it is in the uh, normal environment that business operate, well, that that business news company operates in. Look, I think I think there are there's corporate pressure anywhere. I mean, I. I haven't worked at, you know, our, our competitors, um, like, you know, CNBC, for example, may have a story on Comcast. They're owned by Comcast. They may have a story on Comcast that's, that's not so flattering. Um, there may some, maybe, maybe some pressure there. Um, if you work over at CNN, they're owned by Time Warner. What if there's a scandal inside of Time Warner? The stock's going to go down. Do we report it? Again, that's that's over there. I mean, I worked at CNN 20 years ago. I have no idea. They weren't owned by Time Warner when I worked there. They were owned by a guy named Ted, uh, Ted Turner. It was a private company, and it, things were different then. So um, certainly there's always pressure, but I think the, 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 the big pressure is to get it right. Is it true? If it's true, it's news. In order to be news, it has to be true. And there's ways that we get to the truth by, by, with, with sourcing, double sourcing, triple sourcing, uh, double checking, making sure uh, the news that we put out is is verified. But and then, look, there are pressures um, in in every organization, but but for for us at least, it's it's to get it right uh, and to make sure it's true. Yes. Uh, hello, I I have the microphone. I'll pass it. Uh, I'm Alexis Kouros from Helsinki Times. Uh, Regarding this, the example you just mentioned, uh, and in general, how do you, how do you make sure, uh, how much effort did you, do you put on finding out the motive 
of your sources. I mean, uh, I assume that a lot of uh, information which comes the way you just mentioned is a leak. Mm. That person has a motive. Maybe the company has instructed him. Well, in this case, would be hard to imagine. But uh, in many other cases, like in politics, they, they leak something to you. As a news agency, how do you make sure that you are not being used for uh, purposes of the, you know, people behind the sources? Or does it matter if the story is true? It always matters if the story is true. It has to be true in order to be news. I have always believed, as a reporter, as a career journalist, we're getting used. They're using us. That's what we're there for. So it's a good question because, of course, of course, the source, and, and I've had a lot of, a lot of sources on, on big stories in my, my career, especially when I was a police reporter. Like, I would just have, like, one disgruntled police officer after another giving me tips. But as, as a reporter, I mean, those are the kind of people we're looking for. We're look, the police chief's not going to give you this story. The... Um, the PR person from Rio Tinto is not going to give you this story. It's their job to keep that story from you. It's the people that work there, building the relationships with the people who are, quote, in the know. Um, that's where you're going to get the information from. They're going to know what we call the scuttlebutt. They're going to know what's going on, okay, internally. So, Look, I mean, everybody has an agenda. That's just the reality of being a reporter. Everybody has an agenda. Some are disgruntled employees. Some are angry with, I don't know, the, the chairman of the company. And they believe that getting the story out is, is a way for them to, I don't know, settle a score with, with somebody. Some people, however, believe that, you know, look, there's something wrong going on here. And the right thing to do is to get it out into the public domain and to get get the truth out and and if the truth is not is being covered up then you know they believe that, that that's not right so we we go through that a lot but it, it's it's a very it's a valid point and and i think journalists have to be very very careful about agendas and and how they're being used uh this is really a follow-up to the last question uh but I wonder if you could give us any instances of how your agency has had to take action against the risks of human temptation. I'm thinking of uh, insider trading or of deliberate manipulation of the markets uh, for the gain of persons or persons unknown. Are you ever the victim of uh, hoaxes uh, from outside? What do you do to guard against all that? Well, that's, it's good. I mean, we're, we're, we have to be very careful. I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know with the, whether it was a year, year and a half ago, there, there's a company called Avon Products in the U.S., and somebody sent out a, a fake press release about something, and the stock plummeted. I mean, or, you know, it was reported everywhere, and the stock went down. Or there was something with United Airlines, and the stock dropped, and it was, it was, a, it was a hoax. It was a fake story. Look, I mean, you know, I don't, currently work on that side of the business anymore, so I'm not as familiar with the process. I can just tell you um, my experience in Mongolia with this breaking story that had so much on the line. I mean, it went through so many editors. It went through like 12 people around the world. And I remember saying to the, to the number two in the, in the news organization at the time, I, I thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. Because I, you know, we, we've all done stories where one or two people look at it and may say, oh, yeah, let's put it on the air. And this was not the case at all. This was like, okay, this is, this is what really important journalism uh, is. And so we, we know as an organization how much is, is on the line. And that's why I think we have, we've got 2,700 journalists around the world. And a good, a good number of them are, are editors, making sure it's right and, and checking, you know, making sure that the source is okay and, um, and we, we just won't put it out until, it, until it's confirmed. But we've, we've become a very, very good organization at doing this very, very fast. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. So let me uh, get on with it real quick. Um, so, oh, let's go back here. All right. So 
look, how do we make it interesting? You know, we put, we put a face to the data, and it's about personalities. It's about uh, guys like Tom Barrick Jr., one of the richest um, investors, uh, entrepreneurs in, in the world, a billionaire, um, and a very big supporter of uh, President Trump. Uh, Jay Ireland, the president and CEO of GE Africa. When, when Jay gets on television, um, people listen. People pay attention. They, they hang on on the words that, that he says. He's talking about GE's operation in Africa and how the political change in, in Washington could affect um, you know, the U.S.'s commitment to, to, to Africa. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, we just had her on, on the other day. Um, she's very interesting. So, so when we get people like this, and they're, they're hard people to book, they're very hard to get uh, on television, but um, we, we find that when they have a message, they, they come to us. And hopefully they come to us before they, come, they go to our, our competitors. Okay, so we're always looking for these kinds of personalities. Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon, Governor Kellen Beitov, uh, to talk about the developments here in, in Kazakhstan. Um, and all things about, about Kazakhstan. He's a great spokesperson for um, everything that's going on here. So our team at Bloomberg Television are looking for personalities to come into the, to, into, into the office to give an interview. One thing we ask every day, and I'm going to wrap up the content part, and we'll start talking about money very briefly, because I think you, you really have to understand the content. One thing we, we talk about a lot, if it's a story and business news, will it move the markets? That's a big question, okay? So we touched on that uh, in the beginning. Prime Minister uh, Theresa May coming out, talking about Brexit, and then there's a shot of the on our screen, there's a shot of the currency, and it, you can watch it moving up and down depending on what she says. So that is the, the cause and effect part of, of business news. Tom Barrick Jr., investor interview, what he says matters, and you can watch on the bottom of the screen the markets moving up or down, uh, red being down, green being up, some of them uh, unchanged. A lot of people watch business news with the volume down. So it's really important that the words on the screen, you know, the words on the screen make sense, that they, they tell you, you should be able to watch um, with the sound off and you know what's going on. And so that's why we have all of this data on the screen and a big personality there um, being interviewed. Jay Ireland, uh, again, so people, people listen, uh, peop when, when you put Jay Ireland on, um, the viewers oh, want to stay and, and listen to that interview. Okay, here's the, uh, the, the hard part. How do we make money? A few years ago, as I told you, I was in Mongolia, and, and our very, very big boss came, came to Mongolia, and he, he, we, we sat down, and he said, he said, how are we doing? Hey, I, I said, look, you know, the shows are really good. You know, it looks like, it looks like us. It, it, you know, it's this Mongolian language channel. It feels like Bloomberg, you know, the operation's working. The employees are happy. And he said to me, no, no, how are we doing? Like this. I said, okay. So the bosses today the leaders in media who've just gone through journalism, the right thing to do in journalism and the content, the, the managers in media today want to know how we doing on the bottom line. So that's where the, the money part comes in. Now do you, I just want to get an understanding of the audience here. Are, are, do you guys understand, ladies and gentlemen, do you understand how media organizations survive and make money. How much do you know about this? Please.
Um, sorry for that. Well, I guess, I mean, it depends on the ownership of the organization that we're talking about. But if we talk about the um, kind of standard um, business model that would be advertising, I think that would be the big portion of, the, of it. Then it could be some funded content, I suppose. Um, and I'm not sure how much social media distribution can get you money, but um, the subscription, I guess, is another way of generating money for a news organization. That would yeah, be my guess, yeah. These are, yeah, these are, these are some of the traditional ways in which media organizations um, make money or have made money in the past. Uh, but why this is so challenging now for everyone to make money is because of digital news, because of smartphones, and because of social media. We have, you know, we've just covered the content and how do we get content and how do we break news and uh, get stories out there, but now we have, we have a lot of competition, a lot more than we, we've, ever, we've ever known, at least in, in, in the West. I mean, we, we used to have, I mean, before 24-hour news, we had three networks and everybody went around the, the TV and, and watched, you know, what was on the evening news at 6.30, and they made, they made a lot of money from advertisers because it was the only, the, the only thing they had to do to make ends meet. And then, you know, we, had, we came 24-hour news, and then came digital and social media. So we, we, we say in, in the, the revenue world that the, the ad dollars are now atomized. Does that make sense? They're everywhere. There's some ad dollars on, on mobile. There's some ad dollars on, you know, on desktop. There's some ad dollars in, in print. There's some ad dollars in, in television. Um, so trying to figure out where the money is, I, I think anybody who tells you that they, they understand the, the future of revenue and media w would not be... Um, telling you the truth. I, I don't think anybody really knows right now. And I think we admit it. I mean, you know, we admit it publicly that we're, we're able, to, we're, we're trying out new things, new, new ideas in how to, how to, how to survive um, in, in the revenue game. So the traditional revenue streams, uh, TV distribution. Now, I think in this part of the world, the distribution is not a revenue stream. I know um, in, in parts of Asia, uh, Central Asia that, I, that I've worked in, you know, we had to pay for distribution. And I think that's how it works here, that the broadcaster or the TV channel or the media organization pays the cable company to get onto the platform. In the U.S., or do they pay, do they, does the cable company pays the, the broadcaster? How much? Little, little money, right? Okay, so in the U.S., it's very different. The cable company pays CNN, I don't know, last time I checked, it was 58 cents per subscriber um, uh, to the cable company. So it, it, TV distribution is a huge revenue stream for CNN in the U.S., Fox News, MSNBC. These cable channels that you hear about make a lot of money, most of their money, on distribution, not on advertising, okay? So because their, their viewership is, is not, not that high, it's distribution. And that model is, is changing um, as we speak. Um, of course, there's advertising, advertising around programming. So, for example, um, our prime time at Bloomberg Television is when the market opens. So in, in the morning, we build up to the opening of the markets in London, well, well, in Hong Kong, in London, and in New York. That's when our viewership is the highest. So we might say to HSBC, would you like to, to, to have some spots in prime time? And, and the, you know, this is what you're going to pay. Uh, digital subscription. The New York Times has it. The Wall Street Journal has had it since the late 90s. The New York Times is quite late to this idea that you would have a, what we call a paywall. Uh, but because their revenue is dropping, they've had to go to a, a subscription uh, model. Um, 
we at you know, Bloomberg.com, if we can get uh, Bloomberg.com up, the, uh, the website. Okay, so, so there's our website, Bloomberg.com. There's no paywall here. This is, anybody can get, get this content. And we do have advertisers on, on our, you know, our, our digital site. Um, and this is, this is growing. Our digital usership is growing uh, year on year. Um, but other, other organizations have different models for, for uh, revenue generation. So there's licensing. If we can go back to the deck, the presentation, I just wanted to show you our, our website here. Um, if, I could, if I could go, could we go back to the presentation? Okay. So back to this here. Another revenue stream is licensing. Um, so our partnerships, channels around, around the world, that's a, that's a revenue stream uh, for us um, because they use our, our brand and our logo and our content. Um, and then there's circulation for newspapers. So that's the uh, traditional, traditional um, revenue streams. Finally, and then I'll take your questions because we're running out of time. If we just go to the here, the next slide here. Is there any way to make it a bit uh, smaller? So this is what this is what the there's there's a couple things I'll, I'll talk about on the future of media here, and then I'll take all of your questions. Creating content for marketers. We are, we are now, we have Bloomberg Media Studios. CNN has their own content studio. The Wall Street Journal has their content studio. And we say to marketers or you know, whoever wants their, their, to, 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 um, uh, their brand to be out there, to be marketed, uh, to buy advertising, we say, look, we can create the ad for you. We can create the story for you. So instead of, instead of the company, Boeing, Airbus, HSBC, UBS, um, Kazakh Invest, okay, we say, look, we'll, we'll come out and do the stories for you. So the future is there's a commercial newsroom in, in, in our media organization, and there's the editorial newsroom. And so we're creating um, ads for, for companies and for, for governments. Um, as we speak, um, we could. I mean, if we if we wanted to, we have a lot of data. We're a data company. We could we could. I don't know. Not, not saying we would, but but some organizations are doing that. They're selling their data. You know, but someone someone goes to WallStreetJournal.com. Well, you you know a lot about them. They could then go ahead and and sell that to. Uh, a company, so the company can figure out where their users are, the demographics, so on and so forth. Brand advice. We could, if we wanted to, not saying we would, but we could go to Kazakh Invest and say, look, we can, we can help you with your brand. We know investors better than anybody. You know, that could be a, a bit of a consultancy if we wanted to. Financial Times could do it. Um, that could be an idea that I think organizations are looking at. And, and finally, um, we have events. We have a lot of events where, you know, I, I work with governments around the world, and they all, a lot of them tell me, they say, look, I want to meet investors. I want to come face to face with investors. I want to network with people who may invest in, in, in my country, whether it be Kenya, South Africa, Rwanda, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan. Um, India, uh, the UK, they want to come face to face with these investors. And so there are 
you know, Bloomberg events, you know, at the, like at the IMF and the World Bank meetings, we'll be there. And so um, our partners, our clients, whether it's a government or a bank or, you know, a GE could, could come and sponsor an event and, and, and get involved in, in some networking and be part of that event. So that's really uh, all I have today. I spent a little more time on content, but I, I really wanted you guys to understand content and how it relates uh, to, to revenue. And I think now, <clears throat> I think now we've got about, what do we have, 10 minutes left? I think we have 10 minutes, right? Yeah, so, so why don't we go ahead and take some questions um, and anything you want to ask about what we've just covered. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Regarding the new revenue models you mentioned, is it working? Because, you know, I, I know from our own medias that it's really tough nowadays that people are used to getting their information for free. And uh, additionally, do you also, I don't know if you want to say that or not, but do you use content marketing sponsored articles? Would you publish something if people would pay, pay for that? We do, we do, yeah. We, we, do, we do sponsored content, and, but we label it sponsored content. We say that this, you know, up top in, in pretty big letters, so that the, because back to, you know, the, the general public, they, they, they need to know that, you know, this story we've written on, I don't know, uh, some company, whether it's HSBC or some country, was, was paid for. Um, so we do we do label it now some of our competitors however don't and we know I know that and I won't tell you which ones but I know that some of their content is not labeled as paid and we, we know it was paid for so it's it's a very because of that competitive uh, playing field it's very very difficult these days uh, can you tell us like uh, how, how is the Bloomberg revenue divided uh, among all these different methods, the new ones and the old ones, where does the money come from, percentage-wise? Well, I don't, I don't have the exact exact breakdown, but it's, um, it's. It, let me just go back to this. If I can go backwards here, okay, yeah. The, 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 the by and large, our biggest revenue stream is still advertising, but we are seeing advertising go down. We are seeing the numbers go down. The size of our partnerships in terms of revenue is going down, which is causing us to look at these new, uh, these new things, um, these new opportunities that we, we probably would not have had to think about 10 or 15 years ago. But now we're, we, we have to think about it. And we're very lucky in, in our company because we have a different business. We are a data company with media. The others, our competitors, are media companies. They are, they are full-fledged media companies. We have um, the Bloomberg Terminal, which is the main part of our business. And that's, you know, that's a big part of our revenue as Bloomberg LP. And so we feel very lucky on the media side because we, it's like being in a lab. We have, we have the backing of our full company to experiment, to try new things. We don't have the, we have pressure. Let me tell you, we have pressure, but we don't have the kind of pressure our competitors do, because for them, it's the media side is life and death. For us, it's, it, there's a lot of pressure, but we're not going to go out of business um, as a result of something, you know, a, a, you know a, a number on the media side being a little bit less um, than we expected. So, so we're, we're very lucky in that regard. But this new revenue stream, think of it like a lab. We're trying a lot of things out. And we say the jury's still out. We don't, we don't really know what's going to work. And, and it's changing very, very fast. And we're adapting. Добрый день. Гульмира Сарбасова, Международное информационное агентство Казинформ. Уважаемый Тодд Бейер, хотелось бы узнать, что интересно о Блумбергу в Казахстане. Люди, события, издания, какие инфоповоды. Расскажите, пожалуйста. Понятно? 
Uh, Dober Dean. <laughs> Spicebo. Koprak Miet. Um, what could be interesting for, for Bloomberg in, in Kazakhstan? My, my thing in Kazakhstan, I say everything. <laughs> everything is interesting for us in, in Kazakhstan. I, I, look, I, I'm a little biased towards Central Asia because I lived here. And um, I look around and I, as, as a, let's say, former reporter, I, I think of like 10 interesting stories that I could do just walking around the block. And um, look, it's, it's an oil producer. It's, a, it's an emerging economy. Um, you're building a financial center, the Astana International Financial Center, which we find to be fascinating. It'll be the, the only financial center for, uh, between Shanghai and Dubai. It's Central Asia's biggest economy. You're hosting Expo 2017 here. Look, I mean, it's, it's moving very quickly. There are big ambitions. And, and from what I can tell, you know, if, you, if you look around Astana, I mean, every time I come to, to Astana, something changes infrastructure-wise. There's a new road, a new hotel. Things are moving here. And, 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 and this is a compelling story not just for business news, but for, for any news agency. Yes. Uh, Dina Suleiminova, uh, Law Society of Kazakhstan. Uh, as a lawyer, I have a question for you. Uh, we all know that some truth, sometimes truth, good news, can be get only by out of space of legislation. And in a uh, continental legal system, it's more easy to regulate such information. But uh, in the UK, in the common law, we ho I, I hope you remember the case with the law of confidential with taxpayers. Mm. And uh, which problems, I have two questions. First question, which problems the journalists in the UK, in the common law, have uh, with legislation, with, with some, may, maybe you have some cases when uh, the journalist, when the information was forbidden by the Supreme Court or some maybe Queen's Division Court. And uh, another question is where is the red line of information, information which was get by the legal power and the information that was get only like a good news, the hot news. So in, in the UK, I, I have not been a journalist in the UK. Um, I, I've never actually covered a story there. I don't, I'm not familiar with, with the laws. I believe, in, and Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there's a freedom of information law. We, we call in, in the US, and we had it in Mexico, it's, it's a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act where as reporters you can you know, ap apply or you can appeal to a government agency for a piece of information. Is, is that what you're referring to? Okay. So yes, I mean in, in the UK there, there is that, that ability for journalists if they, if they are blocked by the government or they, the government will not comment on something, they can then uh, go through the process which, at least in the U.S., it's quite expensive. So news organizations, some, um, are reluctant to, to, to pursue that, that end. But there is that, that opportunity for a journalist to get uh, government information through a Freedom of Information Act request. But look, journalists, no matter where they are, all have challenges, whether it's from governments, or companies, I mean, companies invest a lot of money, and, and, and so do governments. They invest a lot of money in protecting their reputation. They have to. So if you're covering a company, whether it's Boeing or Rio Tinto or Nike, they, they have a, a very large public relations staff that is paid very well to manage the news about their company because they have to. So. To your first question is, look, the journalists in the UK are facing the same challenges as the journalists in the US and you know, in a lot of other places, in a lot of de other democratic uh, countries. And your second question, did I? 
Well, I mean, look, some, some news organizations will, will sue a government agency for the information if they can't get it. Um, you're seeing some problems with, with the, in the U.S. right now with, you know, um, traditionally the, the, the White House would, would, would be much more open to the press and, and, and they're not so much, uh, this, new, this White House isn't uh, so friendly with, with the press or, or so open. So, you know, look, all news organizations have a lot of lawyers. You know, we always say we've got, we got 42 lawyers up on the sixth floor just waiting to sue somebody. And <laughs> there are a lot of busy lawyers these days. So, um, yes, I mean, a lot of organizations are, are facing these challenges and, and, and suing government agencies or companies for, public companies for, for information. Thank you very much. My name is Sagit, um, and I have two questions, if I may. First one is, uh, as you said before, you're pretty familiar with Central Asia and probably with Kazakhstan because you know Kupra Ahmed. And uh, yeah, uh, what would you recommend? And what what is your t uh, take on uh, media in Kazakhstan? I mean, what would you recommend to improve in media? I mean, uh, in TV or newspapers, anything. Just your recommendations. And second question is about the concept of fake news, which is uh, promoted by some conservative media in the US and uh, some other people. Uh, what do you think about the fake news concept and the dangers that uh, it may uh, give to uh, media? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I also know Hosh Keldeniz. Okay. I I think in Turkish it's Hosh Kildeniz, yeah? Hosh Kildeniz, Hosh Kildeniz. Uh, but thank you very much. Yeah, um, very quickly, um, what would I say to, to uh, Kazakh journalists to improve the media? It's pretty much the same thing I'd say to any journalist anywhere else in the world, and it's really just kind of following these, these principles of telling real stories about real people, um, getting to the truth uh, um, as best you can. Um, always be first, but first be right. Um, I've looked at some of the TV channels and, and the production looks good. You know, I, I, I watched a, I was sit, sitting out outside of the Minister of uh, Information's office for a few hours uh, last year and uh, I watched a, a TV channel and there was a bulletin in Russian, one in Kazakh and one in English and it all looked, it all looked very good to me. But, you know, certainly journalists here have, you know, the restrictions that journalists in, in the West don't have and so those are, those are challenges. But. Uh, you know, everything we covered here, I think, uh, is, is the advice I'd give. And, of course, fake news is, 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 is very dangerous. And, um, you know, anybody could say a story's fake, right? We've learned that. So that could be a defense now that, that well, I didn't like the story, so it's fake. Um, but, you know, in the, infra in the digital age, you know, there's a lot of information out that flying around, and, and, and it, it, the onus is on us as journalists to make sure uh, the stuff that we put out is true. I think that's the time. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate uh, your questions, and um, if you have any further questions, I'll, I'll be around for the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Todd.